Hello, welcome to the Rare Disease Podcast for Medics. I'm Dr. Lucy Mackay from Medics for Rare Diseases, and my guest today is an author, patient advocate, and activist for greater access to higher education. Tilly Rose read English at Jesus College, Oxford, and this is where she started a free platform called That Oxford Girl, and subsequently published a book of the same name, all centering on facilitating greater access to Oxford University. Tilly achieved all this while living with a chronic undiagnosed condition, which turned out to be active tuberculosis. And in 2022, through her social media activism, she documented her time in hospital and shone the light on the reality of the diagnostic odyssey. Thanks to her sharing personal and raw details of her story, she's gained a followership of over 50,000 people who now better understand this phenomenon that is the foundation of most rare disease journeys today. Last year, she signed with the Soho Agency for her memoir, Be Patient, a warm, darkly comic account of her lifetime behind the hospital curtain. Welcome, Tilly Rose. Hi, Lucy. Thank you so much for having me on today and for that lovely introduction. As you said, my name is Tilly and I'm the founder of That Oxford Girl, which is a free platform increasing access, social mobility and diversity at Oxford University. This stemmed from my experience of both applying to and studying, as you said, at Jesus College, where I read English literature and language. And I subsequently published a book called That Oxford Girl, A Real Student's Guide to Oxford University, showing the mysterious world behind the college walls. It is mysterious. I can definitely attest to that because my husband also, by complete coincidence, he went to Jesus College, Oxford. And if you've ever been to Oxford, it is full of rules and traditions and all sorts of things that are just unfathomable to the uninformed. It really is, yeah, and can be very intimidating as a result of that. That is absolutely for sure. So while you were at university, you founded That Oxford Girl. Can you tell me about it? Like, what did you, what made it that you needed help to get access to go to a university like Oxford University? You know, for the listeners who can't see us, we're two white women with fairly posh accents. I hope you don't mind me saying. (laughs) So what made it difficult for you that made you want to make a platform like this? So it was a bit of a crazy story, really. I think, yeah, some of what you're saying relates pretty well to that in that you can easily make assumptions about people just based on how they speak or how they look. And I guess, yeah, this story, my story, I believe kind of defies that. And what I've learned on this journey is that that is so often the case. So my journey to Oxford started when I was 10 years old. I unfortunately became ill for the first time, age 10. I'd been a healthy child until then, but age 10, I had a burst appendix and I got what the medics at the time said was pneumonia for the first time. I missed a lot of time off school during that year. And the doctor turned around to my mum and said, before she goes back to school, Tilly needs to test her stamina and try and do a day out somewhere. So my mum said, where do you fancy going? She offered me the science museum, which wasn't really my thing, didn't like science. (laughs) Or she offered me a day out in Oxford and it wasn't too far from where we lived. I picked Oxford and the plan was really just to go for a day out shopping, maybe go for lunch. Whilst we were there, we stumbled across a sign outside Balliol College, which is one of the Oxford University colleges. And it said that the public could go and have a look around. We ended up walking into this quad in Balliol and I turned around to my mum and dad and said, I'm going here, (laughs) to which everyone sort of laughed. But I got it into my head that that was from that point onwards, really, my goal. And then in the years which followed, my health really deteriorated and the subsequent, my teenage years were punctuated with ambulance admissions, repeated pneumonias, IV antibiotics. It was when I was 16, uh, things really went downhill and I ended up having to have an emergency bowel resection. But still, nobody could work out what was wrong with me. 
or why these very strange things were happening. It was like all different parts of my body were just failing because nobody could find the cause. And I underwent so many tests, but yeah, I was very much living in the rare, in the undiagnosed, which this podcast reveals is a really vulnerable place to be in medicine. But I held on to the dream of Oxford My teachers told me not to bother taking my GCSEs. I was at a state school. They told me not to bother applying to university. No one in my family had been to university, but this this was my dream. And to be honest, this was what kept me going. So I taught myself from hospital, from home. I would be in hospital beds, sitting in waiting rooms with my cue cards, revising. And I went on, as you said, to be offered a place at Jesus College Oxford to read English literature and language and it was an absolute dream come true for me. It was the best experience of my life and something I've still never really got over. Definitely my proudest achievement and it was whilst I was at Jesus I found out that I'd been living with 13 years of undiagnosed active tuberculosis and I would have to commence 18 months of antibiotic and chemotherapy treatment. I was still on that treatment when I graduated I couldn't go and get a full-time job like all of my friends. So I asked myself, what am I good at? And that was writing. And what do I know about? And that was Oxford. I remember thinking how much I would have benefited when I was applying from a free insight into the application process and student life, which, as you said, at this very mysterious university, that was where the idea for that Oxford girl came about. And It started off as just a stopgap for my CV, but it turned into this free platform, which, as I said, is increasing access, social mobility and diversity at Oxford Uni. And we now have over 100 current students writing for the platform and sharing their experiences about overcoming barriers when applying to one of these top institutions. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, I've been on the I've been on the platform and had a look and looked at some of the stories of the other people who've shared on there. And it's truly a great resource. And I I recommend that people check it out in the notes. And I have to say, you know, getting into get getting into higher education where you're when you have a chronic medical condition, undiagnosed medical condition, or even, you know, In my case, I had to take some time to have a major operation during my GCSE year or after my GCSE year. It's really destabilizing and everyone else is on this kind of march through school that doesn't vary. And then you're the person who is just off that track. And sometimes schools aren't that great at keeping you moving forward when you most need to be kept moving forward. And like you said about, you know, be quite, it's easy to say to someone, oh, you know, it's, that might be too much for you right now. But like, but I like how you said the aspiration kept you going. Definitely. I think for me, the, the studying itself, I always say became a coping mechanism. That was my drive. And I put that out there for any patient. I think it's so important to have a distraction outside of patient life. And to have some sort of goal that, as you say, keeps you keeps you moving forward, because particularly when you're living with an undiagnosed condition and or even a rare condition that isn't so well understood, it can very much feel like the trajectory isn't moving forward. So to have something else in your life that is, I think, is really important. Yeah, I th- this issue came up quite a lot with the during the pandemic and isolation and things where people who live with chronic uncertainty because, you know, they're the one person in the country who has that condition and they live every day not knowing what the future is going to hold for them and then being told that they have to stay indoors or they have to limit things. And actually, I think I think more kudos could be given to people like when you're in your situation and when you live with a condition with and sort of an uncertain prognosis that your ability to deal with what might the future hold becomes a lot greater than the average person and so actually if you don't know what the future is going to hold then you might as well just go for your dreams maybe yeah definitely yeah I completely agree and I think that you're right the pandemic illuminated a life that 
sadly, people living with chronic undiagnosed rare conditions were having to go through sort of every day. And suddenly the wider population yes. was having to sort of deal with yes. something that actually is just your life day to day. And yeah, as you say, if you're having to shield or something, it then actually just made it even worse. So, and I often think there's a, there's a, a mindset sometimes that you start to think people have it with family and friends oh well that that person's been ill for years they can cope with it they know what it feels like they're good at dealing with it these are all sorts of phrases that I've heard and I often think actually or I believe people need to stop and think is it not worse if you've had it for years and years is it not worse if you've missed every party every holiday every event is that not worse than missing maybe just the one event or just the period of say COVID that, that went on for a few years I often say that you almost need to stop and question is it worse ending up in hospital just the once or is it actually worse by the time you end up there the hundredth time the analogy I always use is if you're prodded with a needle once it really hurts but if you're prodded a hundred times that's really really horrible <laughs> yeah you might be used to it it doesn't make it any better it doesn't make it any better it still hurts yeah. Um, and it's worse right like you're having to deal with that pain again and again and again so, yeah and the skin underneath yeah. is probably quite traumatized exactly yeah. Um, so, yeah I think that's yeah a way of looking at it <laughs> I agree I totally agree I, I mentioned I had a back operation when I was 16 I had to wear a back brace from like chin to below my hips for six months and people used to say to me quite a lot oh you must have got used to it and I'd always think and look at them and go no you've got used to it yeah that's really you've true other to people's it. attitudes towards you yeah every day that I have to bath over a board with a shower mm -hmm. you know just every night when I have to sleep in it you know when it's boiling hot I feel it every time just as bad as it was last week <laughs> you've just yeah. got used to seeing me in it yeah and now you don't see it but it doesn't mean it's not there no so true yeah your life is just still as difficult <laughs> Or yeah. more difficult so you had to deal with it for longer I think I think in terms of the accessibility in and making Oxford not just a you know one that Oxford girl not just about the applying to universities like Oxford but actually living there and being there so I said my husband went to Jesus and to me it was completely out of my realms this whole like going to an Oxbridge university I wasn't the first person to go to university in my family that was my brother but I was the second person so you know that kind of uh, that kind of world was very very new and I remember going to visit him and feeling so intimidated being in the what's called the JCR the junior common yeah. room <laughs> surrounded by people who it felt like they were born to be there and knew how it worked and what all of the acronyms meant and everything and what really brought it back to me was looking on your website and uh, looking on your platform and the bit about traditions and subfusk, you know, suddenly yeah. you're in this, this world, lingo, and this is a new language. All, this, all this jargon you don't understand and it others you. It basically makes you not part of the group. And, but a tradition that I did love, however, which was trashings. Yeah. I think that's a particularly Jesus tradition. Uh, they do it in college. Yeah. Whereas some other colleges do it kind of just in the city yeah okay um, so trashing is when you finish your exam your final exams yeah yeah and well, everyone throws water to... all over you yeah, yeah so you, you, you're in this sort of as you say it's called this <laughs> this outfit which is very particular to Oxford and you run through the archway into the quad when you finish your final exams and your friends are all there with buckets of water that they throw over you and you're then often handed a bottle of kava which you pop and you try to hit the clock in the clock. Try to hit the clock, yeah. <laughs> and if you hit the clock, and the idea is that you're going to get a first in your exams, which, yeah, that's a, yeah, just a fun celebration of, of finishing those exams, which are often, yeah, highly pressured. Yeah, really, really high pressured. I went to Nottingham at the same time as my husband was at Oxford and Tilly. I don't know how you did it while feeling unwell. I mean... The fact that you graduated, I just think every day you should wake up in the morning and be like, I graduated from Oxford <laughs> when I was really unwell and just be like, it doesn't matter what I do today because I've already <laughs> happened. <ate."> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's like, very I kind. Just, well, no, it's true. <laughs>
One of my friends particularly hated white and wet bread. She particularly hated wet bread. So when it was her trashings, we used to always put bread in the buckets of water. Oh. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's mean that's not a celebration poor thing <laughs> yeah I know you know traditions so quickly verge into bullying don't they but that's that's what's been for you and my last reminiscence I guess would be the second quad is always slippery when wet is that yeah. like so, so you were there when obviously I'm guessing you're maybe then boyfriend was yeah <laughs> was being trashed <laughs> yeah oh yeah yeah and I was I was I partook in quite a lot of trashings. You got involved sort of a lot of my life, pretending that I was meant to be at Oxford. No, not because <laughs> I wanted to be, just like trying to go through, go under the radar. <laughs> to the point that the porter in the in the lodge was like, thought I was yeah. Started to recognise you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But in all seriousness, those those, those traditions and that. Those traditions and lingo, while can be fun when you're on the inside, can be really detrimental for those who feel like they're on the outside. And I think that there's kind of a parallel here with how patients can be made to feel in hospital or when navigating healthcare. You've got a lot of jargon, you've got a lot of acronyms, a common understanding between healthcare professionals or doctors that the patient isn't necessarily privy to. And I think that's quite an interesting thing that you've already tried to take down some of the barriers of in this higher education institution. And then at the next sort of part of your life, you are kind of end up doing the same thing. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, the next, the next part of sort of my journey has been revealing the inside of patient life. So behind that, as I say, blue hospital curtain, giving an insight into what actually goes on. And I always describe myself as sadly the expert patient because I've had many, many years in training. And I think particularly living with an undiagnosed condition multiple times in my life, it means that I've ended up under almost every ologist that you can end up under in hospital. And I've had every test going over the years so I feel I've really had that insight into the the various different sectors and when you are privy to that you start to see patterns emerge which have for me led to me being really passionate about now advocating for patients and like you Lucy particularly in the kind of rare disease sphere and the the undiagnosed sphere I think yeah and you know like so many people who are out there with undiagnosed conditions, you're a young woman with an invisible condition. And that can really, can really play a barrier. And so when you first got, because so art, you had your tuberculosis diagnosis, which kind of revealed why you might have been having, why you had problems for such a long time. I would like to I'd like to suggest that had you been in Whitechapel where we've got really high suspicion of tuberculosis, you would have been tested for tuberculosis a lot earlier because it does affect everything like it just does affect everything so if you've got something especially if they've got had pneumonias and then they've got all sorts of other things going on it's like probably check out if it's TB but so I there's that kind of inequity within health and how peace there and how profiling people might mean that you didn't get tested for TB, whereas say someone who's in Whitechapel would have been tested for TB at that point. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. No, it's true. The doctors eventually, when I was diagnosed, said I didn't fit the demographic of mm somebody that you would expect to have tuberculosis and mine was a strange story in that it turned out I'd actually drunk unpasteurized milk at my great aunt's dairy farm unknowingly when I was five years old it turned out that she was pouring the milk over my cereal every day and heading outside with the, with the jug to get it from directly from the cow's udder so it was a, a an odd sort of reason for having it and and tuberculosis wasn't something that was sort of on the radar of the mm. medics 
but yeah as you say where I lived but it's interesting you say that because they did say if maybe I was in a different part of the country it might have been very different and what they mean by demographic is that you're white uh is essentially it which is yeah I think it's just really important to be you know there's this this lingo that hides actually biases that could potentially you know it, those biases are harmful to everyone you know if we if we're treating the purse if we're treating the stats and not the patient with their presentation in front of you then suddenly it becomes all about the profile that you've been given rather than hang on this is a person who has these symptoms it regardless of where they are let's look at the whole picture and see you know what what could be going on yeah no you're right but after the TB being diagnosed, it didn't stop there. No, sadly, it didn't. I was so excited. I, within about two weeks of starting the tuberculosis treatment, I never had another pneumonia again. And I got my life back. And it was amazing. And by the time I finished the treatment, I was working. I was living with friends in London, socialising, exercising, doing all these things that I hadn't been able to do for so long I'd effectively as I say lived a life on the sofa because tuberculosis well, the way it presented for me was exercise equaled pneumonia and that was in terms of just climbing a few flights of stairs that wasn't going to the gym or going on a run so suddenly I could do all these things that I hadn't previously been able to do and it was incredible but then again over about an 18 month period my life then began to deteriorate again but with just sort of nondescript symptoms which I couldn't really pin on anything and because I'd been ill for so many years I sort of thought oh it's just taking me time to adjust and to get over the TB I mean I had never heard of and the medics hadn't heard of anyone who had lived with TB for that long so there was always this question mark over in the long term what it might do but then by the time it got to it was August 2018 and I went into what was my first adrenal crisis and I was told that I had Addison's disease, which is a rare condition, which means that your adrenal glands don't produce cortisol and the body needs cortisol to live, to function. But I was told that if I took steroid, I'd be steroid dependent for the rest of my life. But if I took the medication, I could live a relatively normal life. And there's quite a strong correlation between tuberculosis and Addison's disease. So the picture made a lot of sense. And to be honest, I was relieved. I'd been getting more and more ill up to that point. Lots of people listening who have a rare disease may well be able to relate to the idea that you end up sort of praying for a diagnosis because you know you're ill. So it's not a question mark over whether you're unwell, it's a question mark over whether anything can be done. And suddenly I was being told, yeah, if you take these steroids, you can live your life. But sadly for me, it didn't work out like that. and. I kept needing bigger and bigger doses of steroid and nobody could work out where all this steroid was going. I was losing weight. I wasn't getting any of the symptoms of overdosing. That culminated in me being accepted on a research trial for the hydrocortisone pump. So I now have a pump which through a cannula injects steroid into me 24 seven through the day and night. But the medics then were questioning why I needed all this steroid. And they felt there must be another condition constantly putting my adrenal glands under pressure. Then the question mark arose again over the tuberculosis. And when some of the symptoms began to return, I was then restarted on another 18 months of chemo and antibiotic treatment, which I finished in spring last year. And again, I was meant to get my life back. We all celebrated friends and family sent gifts, flowers, and we were all so excited that I was taking that last dose of the medication. But unfortunately, far from getting better, my life got so much worse, worse than it had it ever got before. I had this very overt reaction where my body appeared to be attacking itself. By summer last year, it reached the stage where I couldn't walk and was in a real, real state. You get your, you get your hope and then you, it, it's never full, fully fulfilled. I think that's such a big thing as, yeah, with, with these sorts of journeys and conditions, you're so right that 
I always say that you want to keep hoping, but mm. unfulfilled hope then leads to this this feeling of despair because you just keep repeatedly being let down. But if Love you don't that. hope, you've got nothing. So I always choose to keep hoping. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. It's just a, it's it, it is just such a lot. And I and the other thing is listening to you you're getting told things and you're assimilating them. Okay. So, right. Okay. Now the doctors have said it's this cool. It's that. So now mm-hmm. I have to do this it is kind of like you get given an instruction and then you're going to do it, but now, okay. So that fits. I see I've made you almost like you make a story because that's how human beings live their mm-hmm. lives. They make stories. It doesn't mean they make stories up. I'm just saying that that's then, okay. Now the doctors have told me my story is this. But so I'm doing this like on a trial, which seems pretty sure that they think it is the having Addison's and, you know, a real dependency on steroids. But now, hang on, you've changed back to the previous story and we're now back on tuberculosis, which I thought was like volume one over. Yeah, you thought that that door was closed. Yeah, <laughs> you know, on from that. <laughs> like watching a sitcom where you're like, no, don't bring that. <laughs> You know, is it, we, I thought that that was tied up kind of thing. Yeah, you're you're right. And you you end up, well, my way of coping with that repeatedly, as you say, a story is a good way to describe it. We always call it sort of having a plan. And you're like, right, OK, this is what I've been told. This is now the plan moving forward. And having a plan becomes a coping mechanism. So you're following that path now and you're hoping again that that path and that plan is going to work out and you end up having to be super flexible because so often the story doesn't go the way you want it and you have no control over that story ultimately well you do everything you can well I do everything I can to help myself but if your body chooses to do something else that's out of your control And when I, like, you know, I don't know if it was the same people, but when I was sick, you get told something, you grasp onto it because that's what you've been told is what's wrong with you. So then when you tell people that, oh, it's it's A, and they're like, oh, right, it's A, okay. You know, I've told my friends and I've told, you know, my employer or whatever that it's A. And then the doctors are like, oh, maybe it's a bit of B. And you're like, okay, that's fine. It's a bit of B. I'll, I'll add a bit of B. It's A and B. And then, you know, you see your friends in two months time, you're like, no, actually it's more A than B. And and then suddenly like there's C, D, E. And then at a certain point, I just felt like you just, I just stopped telling people because they, I'm over at only ever relaying what I've been told, but I often would feel like people are running out of patience for me. Yeah, I can completely relate to that. You are you end up feeling like you sound like a, a mad person because you're you're telling them all these different things that are happening to you. And all you're doing, as you say, is relaying the information that you've been told. But when that starts becoming confusing to you, how confusing is it to somebody who's not living through it? And I think that becomes a real difficulty when living with a, a rare or undiagnosed condition and I think for friends and family hearing that information that you're then passing on if you don't truly understand what's going on they've got almost no chance and unless someone w- is living through that with you which for me has always been my mum and she can dissect every detail with me and knows and is part of every step of the journey I think a a really difficult thing for people living with undiagnosed and rare conditions is who do you talk to? Because if they're not living through every moment with you, they're not necessarily going to understand it. And therefore, you can't have those discussions. You can't necessarily get advice from anyone because they don't even understand what you're talking about. It's like me turning around to friends and saying, oh, my cortisol levels are this. Well, they, they don't know what cortisol is. So you you end up not really having anywhere to go with it. And that's a really horrible place to be as well. Yeah, it's really isolating. And then you can start questioning yourself. And I think that there's a very easy to see spiral from that, like you said, having a needle prick once versus a hundred times, they're not the same thing, the spiral that can come. But it's not just 
people in families and the public when you're trying to talk about your diagnostic journey that that you can lose a sense of people can lose a sense of gravity of what's going on and when those threads start becoming more when it becomes more and more tortuous a journey maybe curiosity starts shutting down when I as I said before had this sort of started having this very overt reaction and I was eventually admitted to hospital Day one, I arrived at the hospital. I was on 240 milligrams of steroid, which is a a huge, huge dose of steroid. Addison's patients are meant to need 20 milligrams. I was rapidly losing weight. I was in, I was very, very unwell. And I was having these attacks throughout the, the day and night. And at the beginning of the admission, the medic seemed fascinated by my case. I had every team coming around the bed, asking questions they were lovely to me they were really kind they were empathetic and at times which was scary in a way but but showed sort of how much my case was impacting them I had doctors crying at the bedside looking at me going through these attacks because nobody knew what they were and nobody knew how to control them but they were so positive in telling me that they were going to sort me that was that was the mindset day one and for myself and for my family like that was a huge relief and I thought okay here I am again but these these people want to help me and that's all you can ever ask for within with I think within the medical setting and I never have an expectation that anybody is going to necessarily solve it but as long as people are trying I think that's that's yeah as a patient all I ever would want and ask for and that was definitely the mindset day one But as you say, Lucy, as the mission progressed, that mindset seemed to change. And after 10 weeks in the hospital, living on an open ward, I'd gone from doctors feeling really sorry for me to almost starting to feel like that you were in some way to blame for what had happened or that you shouldn't really be there anymore and there was an attitude which almost became slightly defensive because ultimately a diagnosis hadn't been found and all these tests had been done and as we used the analogy before day one in that hospital was horrible but 10 weeks on on the open ward it was even worse and even scarier and I'd gone from being paralyzed on the bed I couldn't even move to go to the toilet and doctors at the beginning were saying that that was dreadful to by the end of the admission I had doctors coming to the bed describing my perceived inability to walk asking me if I wanted to be in hospital and also suggesting that the reason that I was now still so unwell was because which is a word as a patient I hate (laughs) deconditioned and I was thinking no no none of the above just as 10 weeks ago when you were all crying around my bedside and in a way in a much worse position because I'm not better they haven't found a diagnosis I'm not blaming anyone for that but that makes the position I'm in now even more frightening I would have thought that would have led to more compassion but it's a distinct pattern that I've seen emerge again and again and not just on this admission but for many years that the attitude from medics often does seem to change I've said on this podcast before that I had an excellent tutor who whose brother had Addison's disease and that really made me remember Addison's disease but even again I'm not thinking of someone who's just out of university and I think that then when it comes to young people there's almost a sense of well if it doesn't kill you it's just going to get better because we don't think of chronic disease early on because we don't associate chronic disease with young people and so when you then have someone really deteriorate who's young you you might be thinking about something like a lymphoma leukemia hopefully like a other kind of endocrine disorders but so they're therefore sort of looking at resuscitation and looking at you know let's make sure that this person looking at the like next few days next few weeks but 
what happens after that when you're a young person with an invisible condition that we know there are tons and like me, you know, thousands of, if you think about that, there's over 7,000 rare diseases and like 80% start in childhood or something like that. But what about all of those people who are still really unwell, but the system isn't made, you could arguably, arguably say for any chronic conditions, but particularly chronic conditions in young people, particularly for diagnosing chronic conditions in young people. And so I can almost sort of see why those, why that mindset comes in, that if you haven't got a diagnosis, then maybe it's because there's nothing to diagnose rather than if you haven't got a diagnosis, it's because we don't actually know everything about medicine yet. And actually within this hospital, there might be stuff that we don't know that we could be knowing about if we referred or got the right test or asked a geneticist or something like that. Yeah, completely. And I think one of the words you just mentioned there was the system. And I do think that that plays a huge role in it. On so many of my hospital admissions, and to, yeah, to be fair to the medics and the doctors, like you see them running around those hospitals and making decisions of, as you said, who's about to die? Who do I need to save right now? And if you go from sort of maybe life-threatening when you go in, but then as you say, something chronic then develops over the weeks that you're in, you're suddenly not a priority in quite the same way. And in a way, when you see the pressure that the medics are under, can can you blame them for that? Like coming to my bedside is gonna be a hell of a lot more complicated to think, research, come up with ideas than going to someone where you're like, right, okay, you've got a bladder infection. I'll give you this antibiotic and you'll get better. Like that's a quick decision that, you know, a doctor can make and hopefully improve someone's health life as a result of that. Whereas I actually had some medic friends who, <laughs> when I was in on my last admission, said they were like, to be perfectly honest, if you were in the bed and I was working as a junior doctor running around that hospital and you see these junior doctors under, you know, sort of doing everything under so much pressure, they were like, Tilly, I'd have, I'd have come to, to your bedside and been like, oh no, I'm not getting involved in this. <laughs> this seems like a lot of hard work and yeah. see you basically. So when, you know, I'm there, my family's there asking all these questions, suggesting tests, etc we're in many ways their worst nightmare and in one way I can see why that happens but it doesn't mean that it's right it make it okay it doesn't make it okay no it doesn't and I think the other sort of net that I fell through last summer and autumn was and again this relates to being undiagnosed I I started the admission and I had a side room. And I always say, <laughs> as a patient, <laughs> that is luxury. You kind of, you you lay down low and hope that nobody notices that you're there because that's the absolute dream to get a side room. But then I got so poorly that I ended up on the highest dependency bed in the high dependency ward of AMU. And that was an extension from the A&E. And most patients stayed on this ward for maximum three days. I was there for over six weeks and the problem arose because most patients would be on AMU, they then diagnose, for instance, that they'd got a chest infection, they'd be moved to respiratory in that instance, whereas I had no diagnosis. So nobody would take ownership of me, nobody would move me to a specialist ward. And as a result of that, each Monday, a new consultant would come on that ward. And by the end, they were having to read 60 days of case notes about me. Well, there was no time to do that. There was no time to digest all the information. And that meant there was no continuity of care. So no one had seen my transition from day one to day 60. And I think that's another huge problem when you don't have a diagnosis. Yeah, I I completely agree. And you know, having what you say there is rings so true to so many diagnostic stories that they come to an end at the point when someone stops and goes, what is really happening here? This is not usual. Like, you know, you had started living 
a full life. I was working, working. Yeah, running my own business. You're not going to choose to spend six weeks in hospital when you could get out. And so looking at it, you know, just stopping, pausing and looking at it sensibly, what's really going on here and taking it back to the beginning. And so many times it's it's people get diagnosed, not when someone stops and goes, it's this diagnosis from out of the blue, like house. But actually when someone stops and goes, hang on, something's happening here and we don't know what it is. And it's our duty of care to know what it is. Or if we don't know what it is to have exhausted all avenues and say, I'm sorry, we don't know what this is. And that's the stopping the diagnostic odyssey. So I guess what we're asking for from people, from from the healthcare system and training and individuals in the healthcare system is not to be able to diagnose all these thousands of rare diseases, but to be able to suspect when someone might be on a diagnostic odyssey that could need a multidisciplinary holistic review with genetic services input. Yeah, definitely. There are a few things you said there which ring so true. One of them is about choice. And I always say being ill isn't a choice. And sometimes when I've been lying in hospital beds and medics have inferred that like the question do you want to be in hospital I think look at where I'm living right now why would anybody ever choose this life like living on an open ward with people screaming out throughout the night people climbing into your bed in the middle of the night and these are some of the things that I don't think people almost real or are thinking about happen when you're in a hospital it's not just about being ill it's all the other things that go with it so people climbing in your bed people screaming out seeing really awful things just meters away from you happen to other people that are heartbreaking that are traumatic even seeing other patients die that these aren't normal day-to-day occurrences that the general population are seeing and I also think, yeah, with you saying stopping to think, stopping to think, why would anybody choose this? Like, I've got friends I want to be seeing, socials I want to be going to, holidays I want to be on, work I want to be doing. Like, that's the life I want to be living beyond this hospital curtain. And I always find it kind of insulting when they suggest that you would want to choose to have the life that, yeah, you're having in that hospital bed. Because I think whatever age you are and yeah I I don't think anybody would choose that so yeah I think that's a big big one yeah I mean I I'm not a licensed clinician anymore but I would just think you know if you're about to suggest that someone has a functional or has a is malingering or everything all of these things everything you've seen including the wacky test results and everything they're all just psychosomatic that would probably be a good time to call genetics I'm not saying that genetics will solve all of those problems but we know from the evidence we know from the fact that there's a genomics medicine service being built in the UK that is like you know greater than any other in the country we know from policy that people are being undiagnosed like underdiagnosed of rare conditions And so not everyone will come out with a diagnosis, like we said, but at the moment, more people are being diagnosed who with, say, a pure, a purely purely mental health condition or something that suggests that there is nothing organically happening, as the, as medicine says, then who then turn out to have a really rare condition and 80% of rare conditions have a genetic origin. So if that's where you're about to go, why not head down a like let's call genetics or let's call someone who might be the right specialty who has greater insight into rare conditions before we end the diagnostic workup but instead they send psychiatry (laughs) (laughs) which is what happened to me (laughs) and what's really sad about that is 
psychiatry is really important and picking up when picking up when people are demonstrating the signs and symptoms of potentially post-traumatic stress disorder or you know other other mental health conditions of that type really really important but and also psychiatry for people who have rare conditions as on top of needing psychiatric input really really important but this either or situation either I know what this is or it doesn't exist and it's all under psychiatry just seems a a little bit simple having the having spoken to the number of people I've spoken to of rare conditions who've been misdiagnosed as having a purely mental health condition yeah and I think so many people who I've spoken to through my social media channels it's a pattern that just seems to emerge again and again and again, that so often when it can't be found, it's put down to stress or it is put down to a psychological condition. And as you say, of course, there's a, there's a huge place for psychiatry within medicine, but it seems binary to, yeah, binary. as you say, suggest an either or. And I, I've always said like, of course, being physically ill is going to impact mentally how you feel but there's a difference between that and having a psychological condition. So of course, like I would be lying if I said that in that hospital over summer and autumn, I wasn't really down and upset and traumatized. Like I admit all of those feelings were there. Yeah. But that didn't mean that, as you say, the reason I was in there was was because of that. that you, was, it didn't put you there in the first place. It didn't put me there. And as you say, I think searching for something organic before jumping to that conclusion it is really important and I always end up turning around probably and uh, annoying annoying the medics in some scenarios but saying things like oh so you know would stress give me pneumonia or w- would stress lead to a bowel resection and at that point it's like well no it, it wouldn't so also so why are we suggesting that this is down to stress and but then you have to be so careful because I think in those scenarios the doctors, in my view, they have the power and they have the power of your care. And it's such a fine balance between sort of standing up for yourself and advocating for yourself, but also staying on the right side of them, which is a really awful thing to say, but I've, I've worked out that it is a game. And if you contradict the doctors too much or seem too knowledgeable or, or your family do, suddenly you don't always get the help that you might want to get. And it's a, yeah, it's a really fine balance, um, that sort of advocacy piece, I think. So I think that brings us nicely into the fact that given you're in this really vulnerable situation this summer, you decided to take your story online through social media, particularly through your Instagram channel, right? At that Tilly Road. Why, why did you do that? Yeah, so I'd already started sharing some of my patient journey on my Instagram channel when I was on the the second lot of TB treatment. And I had had this really overwhelming response with so many people getting in touch, almost saying that I was sort of validating their daily reality, what they what they were going through. And then, as you say, when I ended up in hospital this summer, it got to the point where the medics told me that they were now scraping the barrel for tests. They didn't really know what else to do. And they started using the phrase comfort care, which for me was, that was probably the worst, worst day night of, of my life. I was completely traumatized. I, I couldn't see a future then beyond this hospital. I still couldn't move at this point. I was paralyzed on the bed. I was having these attacks, fits, convulsions. Nobody knew what they were. Nobody knew what was happening to me. And I thought, what have I got to lose by putting it out there, putting my story out there and asking if anyone has got any ideas? So I posted on my Instagram channel. And at this point, I think I had around 15,000 followers. And within a couple of weeks it was almost 50,000 and I'd received hundreds and hundreds of messages from doctors, professors, PhD students and patients 
from all around the world with suggestions of tests, diagnosis ideas, also just so many lovely messages willing me to get better. As a family, we were completely overwhelmed by this. Like these were perfect strangers who were taking the time out of their own days and bothering to get in touch and to try and help. And yeah, it really restored our faith in human beings. And I'll never really get over that, that people, yeah, that were so kind. And these suggestions that they were making, they were good suggestions. They were, they were thinking of the rare. So we then compiled a list of all of these super rare ideas for tests that my family then went away and researched before we presented to the medics. And as I'm sure you know, Lucy, Google doctors, <laughs> as they often call patients, are, are often doctors' worst nightmare. So I'm sure that that behind the scenes probably didn't go down too well. But I always say it's your life and you've got to fight for it. And that's exactly what we did. I think probably, as you touched on before in terms of the genetic piece, that suddenly people were bringing in really rare conditions that potentially someone in their family had had or that they'd been born with that were so sort of niche and beyond the radar of things that you know we'd even consider them my mum spends her entire life life researching yeah. so yeah it was it was like this plethora I guess of ideas which was overwhelming and also the just this some of them with this sort of faith that like saying that I would I would get better whether or not that happened nobody you know nobody at that point could say what was really going to happen but I think that belief yeah that for me as I lay in that hospital bed that's what I needed to hear yeah that's what you needed that, that is what I needed to hear and I think my family could say it as many times as they wanted but suddenly all these people were saying it and that, yeah that was quite amazing really that is it is really amazing I just what a response you know maybe hopefully one day you could sort of do a movie or something and we could have, <laughs> you could have all the people in their different areas acting out them like writing their responses to you I bet it must have been overwhelming yeah well it would be great to think wouldn't it that Instagram could solve this crack this case I've still got hope <laughs> But even if it, we, we've talked about this before, like, even if it doesn't get to a diagnosis, we can come back to that later, but I'm going down that point of at least people showed they cared and were interested mm. and things were done. So at this point, had you had any genetic testing at all? I hadn't at this point, as I say, we were told that, you know, they were scraping the barrel for tests. My mum always says there's always something that can be done. It's never, it's never the end of the journey. And she is um, absolutely <laughs> right. There's always something that's you her can You can always um, do something for someone. And doing something is always better than doing nothing. That's what we always say as well. So I remember my auntie, my, I mean, on this hospital admission, my mum, my auntie, my dad and my boyfriend, I, they, they became known on Instagram as my team, as everyone called them. <laughs> and I, I'm so lucky to have had, you know, people who loved and cared about me around me, because in that respect, yeah, my support system was was amazing. My auntie turned around to me one day and she said, Tilly, you're a you're a zebra in a horse hospital. I just thought that summarised everything and I'm guessing everybody listening knows that the zebra is the symbol of rare disease and my mum then turned around and her line has always been it only takes one person to care and one person really can change your life and enter maverick doctor as we called him <laughs> so as I said earlier the ward that I was on there was a new consultant every Monday so you had them for five days because generally hospitals, as I also have become aware, close down of a weekend, <laughs> which is another systematic difficulty, particularly when you're in for a long time. So on Monday, a yeah, the consultant would arrive on the ward. And this particular Monday, the doctor who arrived, he was infectious disease doctor. And as we began to call him, Maverick. He was the only doctor who 
as you touched on earlier, Lucy, stopped and he stopped to think. So he didn't just come to my bedside and tick the box or come up with the kind of standard textbook ideas. He, as I said, he saw a zebra in front of him and he treated me as a zebra. And his view was, if we haven't found it already, this is going to be something rare. This girl has been in here for so long and she's still really unwell. And I also had these crazy high lactate levels. So my lactate had reached 11 and Maverick <laughs> said to me that with levels like that, I should I should be dead. <laughs> yeah, can, can um, we just pause for all the yeah. medics here? Her lactate was 11. Okay, carry on. Yeah, so my lactate was 11 on multiple occasions. And Maverick said, the fact that you're alive with these lactate levels means, and that we haven't found a, a specific reason as to why your lactate has, has risen this high. He felt that my body must have taken some sort of strange metabolic pathway in order to have survived this. And it was that sort of line of thinking that set him off on this investigation into metabolic and genetic conditions. And he started liaising with the top units at other hospitals in London and with the specialists there to try and coordinate my care with people who were, you know, trained and super specialist in these areas. But that meant him taking so much time out of his own day and night. And there were points when he stayed on the ward at the hospital until 2 a.m. to research my case. He got in contact with consultants, surgeons, doctors I'd been under in the past and spoke to them personally. And he collated my medical history and everything that had happened to me and by the end of it, he knew more about my case than I knew. Like he he completely and utterly threw himself into it. He brought diagrams to the bed to explain to my family what he thought was happening. Because for a large chunk of my admission, they thought I had porphyria. And then that ended up not being the case. But he explained why they thought maybe it was porphyria and how it was maybe mimicking something like porphyria. And he was different to any any doctor that I'd ever really come across. He was a different kind of doctor and he was the sort of doctor that every patient with a rare disease needs. I mean, I'm sorry, we don't know who this doctor is. So if you're <laughs> listening to this and you're after a diagnosis, I, <laughs> I can't help you. But yeah, I, it sounds exactly like what we've talked about before, what I said earlier, what people ask for all the time in terms of, thinking about that diagnostic odyssey and someone I know calls it sorry someone I know calls it the trigger professional you know training we would like to train up doctors to become the trigger professional that stops the diagnostic odyssey in its track and and behaves like Dr Maverick here and stops listens and listens believes and involves the patient and their family is just so crucial and he did he he it wasn't just his attitude towards me it was to my whole family and you know with my consent and he could very much see I was very willing for them to be involved in this story and every, my mum my dad my boyfriend my auntie he completely and utterly he bought into us as a unit and he included them in this this investigation really and he was also interested to know what they thought and what, what we thought was going on and he knew that this had been such a big part of our lives for so long and respected the fact that we did have a knowledge of my condition we did they were completely aware of all the intricate details and, and had seen things on this admission that the medics hadn't all seen because, you know, you have your morning ward round and unless there's a, a terrible emergency, 
sort of day to day, it was my family who were seeing it play out. So he wanted that forensic information from them. And he was the ultimate medical detective in that sense. I mean, I don't want to dive, I don't want to pry too much on what's happening for you now, Tilly, because I think, you know, that's up to you to keep private. I also suspect that I might know <laughs> When, once you get to this point, like I don't, I I might know some of the people who you might be talking to now. So, but where, where, how do you feel in your hope ometer right now? So, had Maverick not been on this admission, I really dread to think where I would be because, as I said before, having a plan for me has been the only way of getting through this. And he gave me a plan for leaving that hospital. I was still, I was still in a really bad way when I was discharged. I, the night before I was discharged, I was in a two and a half hour convulsion that nobody still knew, you know, why, why these things were happening to me. So it was a scary place to be, but I left with a plan. Maverick had been liaising with one of the yeah, top metabolic units in the country. And I had a referral to them. He wrote an eight page report on me, which, yeah, it's, it's when he doctors listening so often, like, which is, you know, very normal. You get a, a max a paragraph about maybe a patient, but he had gone into, yeah, such detail. So what they were receiving about me was so much of the work and the research had been done, which, which is amazing. And I'm now undergoing, yes, yeah, super specialist genetic and metabolic tests. And that seems to be the pathway that, as you said, Lucy, so often I've heard now that when patients can't be diagnosed for so many years and have so many unexplained symptoms, often it can result in it being a genetic, some sort of genetic defect. And that's sort of the line that they're pursuing now. So having a plan, I'm still feeling hopeful. Life is by no means normal still, however upbeat and happy I might sound it's yeah every day is still a, a roller coaster and very very unpredictable still but I feel like there's a plan in place and yeah if there's a plan in place there's hope and I think you know what you're talking about here is our power to diagnose rare conditions is so much greater than it was when you know most doctors were at medical school you know it changes that fast <laughs> so it's really important to be considering these things now because we do have more diagnostic power for certain conditions but also not everyone goes through say whole genome sequencing as an example and gets a diagnosis and they might come out with what's called a syndrome without a name is that something that you think about like have thought about reconciled with yourself that you may never get a diagnosis and and how do you feel about that yeah definitely I mean that's you know this kind of pursuit of a diagnosis has been the story of my life I think the difficulty with even thinking about that not happening is I have seen again and again that without a label without a name your access to even help with the symptoms is is much more difficult so yeah that obviously that's something that I I can I thought about but it's almost something that I don't want to believe is going to happen because which is a real shame and it's or a problem I think in itself that I've seen that as soon as you get that name and that sort of title suddenly you're under a unit you have access maybe to nurses or specialist information or help with pain, medications, research, treatment. Yeah, treatment. When you're in this sort of weird state where nobody's taking ownership, it, the real yeah, challenge is, I think, that you often don't even just get help with your day to day living. Absolutely. And I think that's something that also needs to change. I can, yeah, it's, it's absolutely true the avenues that can get opened with a name language mm -hmm. is so important so much of what medics for rare diseases talks about is really just around language and making people included in dialogues and in services by creating a language around rare disease and my hope is that going forward 
if you've had the best workup you can and people have listened to you, believed you and involved you and still not come out with a name for what you're going through, you can still be validated and appreciated and appropriately cared for regardless of that. That's That would be a hope. I don't think we can ever, you know, as science changes, as medicine changes, we I don't know if anyone can ever say everyone will always get a diagnosis, but at least if people have been given dignity, compassion and listened to and worked up appropriately, and then we're equipped to be able to look after those people without a diagnosis name, then hopefully that goes some way to making a little bit more equity, really. Yeah, definitely. I think validation is a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, living with chronic illnesses, living with undiagnosed illnesses, often, as you say, the language is so important. And without that name or label, I think that so many patients don't get that validation. And it doesn't mean that their daily reality is any better, just simply because they haven't found what's wrong with them as I said earlier maybe in in some scenarios it's worse because they're not getting treatment so yeah I think that's becomes, a, a good hope it, it kind of comes back to what we said at the beginning is it's so easy to make assumptions about what someone's been through and the amazing thing about a name for a condition it means you can paint a picture in a very short period of time but you can also paint a picture by saying I've yeah I have an undiagnosed rare condition it's that the person on the other other side has to appreciate what that might mean you've been through and what you might be going through now. So Medics for Rare Diseases will keep working on that one. Yeah, and thank you for the great work you're doing. It's so important. Oh, well, it's all thanks <laughs> to people like you sharing your stories. And I was wondering if you could share something else with us, which is we are asking our guests what their rare disease disc would be. We've stolen it from some other radio show that we won't mention to create a rare disease disc playlist that we can share because potentially you know because music is a way that can inspire us or help us feel hard and difficult emotions and do you have a song that comes to mind yeah so I agree with you yeah music can be so uplifting when times are tough and whenever my boyfriend picks me up from a hospital admission and we get in the car we put on Andra Day Rise Up because that's what he says <laughs> will be that will be me each time I get knocked back I rise up again so hopefully your listeners will feel the same when they listen to that song. Thank you Tilly Rose and I don't doubt you will be doing the actual radio show Desert Island Discs in <laughs> many years time when you've published even more books and you know just been a voice for the people for other people out there who can't do what you're doing it's just fantastic I also would like to say you know potentially people with rare and chronic conditions who are listening to this could really gain from going on resources that might be able to help them yeah my patient Instagram channel is at that Tilly Rose which is continuing to detail my undiagnosed rare disease journey. And it, yeah, if there's anyone listening who can shine any light, I'm still searching for a diagnosis. So yeah, drop me a message. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and arms again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so can you say anything about Be Patient, your book that's coming? So yeah, I signed with the Soho Agency last year for my memoir, Be Patient, which is an account of my life behind the hospital curtain and also a sort of patient survival guide as well with tips and tricks on, on how to survive the experience. So that is just beginning to be sent off to publishers at the moment. So fingers crossed, watch this Fantastic. space. <laughs> so next February when we're doing the unusual suspects hopefully we can be there with some of your books and have you could do a signing <laughs> that would be great that would be very exciting <laughs> amazing well for everybody who's listening I if you want to get in contact with Tilly Rose see all of the links in the show notes thank you so much Tilly Rose for an absolutely amazing conversation 
I don't know how I'm going to edit it down. So hopefully everyone stayed on for the long haul. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much for having me on, Lucy. Thank you so much for the great work that you're doing because, yeah, my life has shown me just how important it is. And it's amazing to see now that there's an organisation devoted to trying to improve patient care in these rare settings. So thank you. Thank you.